Good morning. How are you all doing? Did someone say, how are you? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Rarely does anyone ask me how I'm doing. I appreciate that. This, uh, this morning, I have been tasked with the opportunity to come up here and preach for us about the role of deacons in the service and the life of the church. And so, this message is a little different uh, than what I'm used to doing, and I'll tell you how it's different. Normally, what I would do is, is pick a scripture, I would read that scripture, and then we would exposit through that scripture, and that would be uh, the entire message. This morning, we are focusing more or less on a topic. And so, what I'm going to be doing this morning is taking us through really a series of scriptures to show for us what deaconing looks like in the life of the church. And so you are going to be seeing me read scripture, but we're not going to have the normal thing at the beginning where I'm having you all stand up. And I really would just like to get right to it. Is that okay with all of you? Okay, well, that's good. You want me to preach. That's nice. So I also understand we have people uh, that are online that are still watching, and my folks are traveling, and so they're one of those that at least they say they're watching. I said it's just because they're too embarrassed to watch me preach, but we know that's not true. They're they're out there watching me, so uh, hello, mom and dad. And let's get right into it. So what exactly is a deacon? Have you ever thought about that? What do deacons do? What is their identity? What's their purpose in the life of the church? And there's no doubt you're coming here this morning and you already have in mind uh, your own conception of what that looks like to you. And so what we're going to do is go through the Word of God this morning and hopefully by the time we're done we all have a very clear picture of what that looks like for for us at First Southern Baptist Church. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to guide us through six points, six main points, and I'm going to say them for you now. If you are sitting in the pews there, you will see sheets of paper that have these six main points on there. I'm just going to say them quickly for us before we get started. First, we're going to examine the historical context of deacons and service in the church, both the Old Testament and the New. Secondly, we're going to look at exactly what the word servant means in Scripture. And so this gets into a little bit of a semantical type of thing, I promise. I'll try my best not to make that boring. It is more teachy, point point number two is, but I think it is very necessary for our overall understanding of deacons. Thirdly, we're going to see that a deacon is an intentional helper in the ministry who helps to carry the burdens for the pastors and helps serve the needs of the church. Fourthly, we're going to see through the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3, that a deacon is, above all else, a godly person. Fifth, we're going to see along those lines that a deacon is a redeemed believer. He is a new creation. And then lastly, to close us out this morning, I hope to provide a word of hope to our own church here at First Southern about the future of deaconing and church leadership here. So with all of that said, hopefully I've I've laid out a very clear blueprint of where we're going to go. And so let's begin with point number one. And this is really fascinating. It's, here's the question, where do deacons come from? And where do we get service in the life of the church? Some people might say that it has begun in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and we're certainly going to be there later. But service in the life of God is absolutely nothing new. And one of the places that we find this is in the book of First Chronicles, where it lays out very clearly... And the reason I chose First Chronicles is so that we don't have to read all of Leviticus. And aren't you happy about that, that I didn't choose Leviticus, that we're not going to read through all of that this morning? All you have to do is sit through this little bit of First Chronicles. And here's what it says in chapter 23, verses 28 through 32. For their duty, that was the priests, was to assist the sons of Aaron for the service of the house of the Lord. And here's their job having the care of the courts and the chambers, the cleansing of all that is holy, and any work for the service of the house of God. Their duty was also to assist with the showbread, the flour for the grain offering, the wafers of unleavened bread, the baked offering, the offering mixed with oil, and all measures of quantity or size. And they were to stand every morning thanking and praising the Lord, and likewise at evening. And whenever burnt offerings were offered to the Lord on Sabbaths, new moons, and feast days, according to the number required of them, regularly before the Lord. Thus, they were to keep charge of the tent of meeting in the sanctuary and to attend the sons of Aaron, their brothers, for the service of the house of the Lord. 
One of the things that we see in the historical context for service in the church, like I said, is that it's nothing new. Now, in the Old Testament, this was the daily service that the priest offered to the temple. It was Israel's worship of the one true God, Yahweh. And as you see, they really had a lot to take care of in the life of, of that sanctuary and of that temple, didn't they? Well, that was the Old Covenant. Thankfully, today, we have a brand new covenant. Aren't we thankful for that? We have a covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this shows us a different but a better way to serve the Lord. Now, when I say new, understand that what I'm saying is almost 2,000 years old. Have you ever thought of service and deaconing in the life of the church as really an expression of new worship, of new covenant worship? You see, we're so far removed from the historical context, and most of us do not have any Jewish heritage or background, and so we are all Gentiles. But if we were Jewish, we would have seen a drastic change in the New Testament church in the way in which people serve the Lord. No longer are there offerings. Church, why are there no longer offerings? Why is there no longer sacrifices? Because Jesus has paid the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. No longer do we go and offer animals and grain offerings and all of these different type of offerings to try to be right with the Lord. The very fact that we have deacon service in the body and the life of the church is a modern-day representation of a new covenant through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So that's part of the, the actual context of service in the church. It shows us that what we do is on purpose. We're not just saying that we have servants because, well, I guess that was a pretty good idea and we'll do that. We have them because this is an intentional and new way in which to worship God under the new covenant. Now, going on to the uh, second point. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? That first point wasn't so long. You heard six points and you thought, we're going to be here for three hours knowing Michael, right? But we got communion today. I know that. So we're going to get through it. Uh, and let's go to the, the second point here is that a deacon is a servant. A deacon is a servant. And so this is the part where I said it's going to be a little bit more uh, dealing with words, uh, but we use these words because it helps us make sense of things. And I want you to try to remember something when we're talking about words. I learned this a long time ago is that words have usages. They don't necessarily have meanings. It's not like you open the dictionary and say, oh, there, got it figured out. This is why when we examine Scripture and we look at words in Scripture, we look at their usages and we see how they are employed in Scripture to help us develop uh, a philosophical way of thinking about these different roles. So is everybody a servant? Is everybody a servant? Well, yes and no. You're going to say, if deacons are servant, aren't we all deacons? And the answer to that is no. We're not all deacons, but we are all servants. And so I'm going to focus specifically on two different words that we find in Scripture that explain service. The first one is leitugreo. Leitugreo, that's the Greek word, which does mean to be of service or to minister. What we're going to find in Scripture is that this is a word that is used in a more general way. We see it in the book of Luke chapter 1. Uh, this is, the, of course, the story of John the Baptist and his birth. And you remember his dad was Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest who served in the house of worship. And so he was part of the old covenant worship. And if you remember, the angel appeared and said, you're going to have a son. And he just could not fathom how this could even be possible. And so his mouth was shut and he couldn't speak. Remember that? And then he was able to speak again when he finally uttered the name of his new son when he said, his name is John. Well, part of Zechariah's role in the church, uh, in, sorry, in, 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 in the temple was in the service, uh, in, the, in this old covenant priesthood. His job that day was to go and burn incense. That was his job, was to go and burn incense. You know how he got that job? Have you ever been at work? And nobody wants to do the one thing. And so you all will like, you know, paper, rock, scissors, or something like that. They cast lots. That's how he ended up burning the incense. So you can see the priest sitting around there. And for me, that's just really funny because it shows kind of the reality of service even in the priesthood. These were not perfect men. These, these were not the, the super crazy, high, holy type. These were, these were guys that were doing a job and they were working in the temple. Who's going to burn incense today? Ah, Let's just throw some lot. Zachariah, you're the man. Go up there, and you can see him walking up there. 
Um, but what's interesting is this word, le, uh, le to greo, say that ten times fast, was to burn the incense in the temple. Now, it is one type of service we see. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it is actually expressed in regards to generosity in giving to the church. And so it is a type of service to give generously. And I don't know if, if you've ever thought of giving that way. Some people see giving as an obligation, but do you see it as service? Do you see it as a type of service that you offer to the church, your generosity in helping others? We see it in the book of Philippians uh, chapter 2. And this is a really deep and profound statement coming from the Apostle Paul. He says this, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and will rejoice with you all. And you're going to say to me, if you were listening to that, where is the word service in that verse? Well, guess what? Modern translation, the word is hidden in there. That word, leitu greo, is found in the word offering. And so the Apostle Paul says, if my offering of myself, if the service of myself in some way helps to advance your purity and holiness, it will be worth it. That's very deep and profound. So have you ever thought of giving your own life and your own self in service to the betterment of holiness to others as a type of service? Well, in all of these instances, we see that this word is used in more of a broad way and more of a less specific way. It's the word service or ministry, but although the usage of the word is weighty and it has a lot to say about how we should think about service in the church, it's not the specific word for deacon. So not everyone is deacons. We are all servants. Um, but we're not all deacons. And so let's, let's look at this word deacon specifically and see what that looks like. So the word for deacon is diakonos or diakonos. And you can almost hear the word deacon in that. And words morph over time. And you can see diakonos, you know, spoken in the Greek. And you could see maybe some Hebrew trying to pronounce that being like diakonos. And then, and then some years later, some European guy comes around and is like, deacon what? And so we can see how we get the word deacon from this specific word. And this word is used many, many places in Scripture. The word deacon is used in many places. You may, you may think through reading Scripture that you would only find it uh, perhaps in the book of 1 Timothy 3, but it's found in many, many other places. We're going to look at just a few of those. One of the first ones is in the book of Matthew chapter 20, uh, verses 26 through 28, your Bibles may have the title on it that says, A Mother's Request. And if you remember, this is the story where the mother of the sons of, of Zebedee, and you remember who the sons of Zebedee were, that was James and John, who Jesus later called, and I love this title, Sons of Thunder. Right? James and John were the sons of thunder. So he had Peter the rock, and he had the sons of thunder. He had Thomas the doubter. Yeah, it's a joke. But they had these really great names, right, that he used to to talk about his disciples and give them their identity. Well, you, you all remember the story. The mother comes and says, Jesus, would you please tell me, could, could my son sit on your right hand and on your left? And, and Jesus' response says this, whoever would be great among you must be your what? Your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, what's special about this verse? What's special is that the word that is being used in this case for the word servant is the word that we use for deacon. Think of it this way. Jesus says, even as the Son of Man came not to be deaconed, but to deacon. That kind of changes the way that we think about that word, doesn't it? Well, what does this mean? It means that it is implying an intentional and assigned, elected and appointed service that is performed in a sacrificial way for the needs of the saints. Just as Jesus was in his service, so our deacons will be in their service. In John 2, 5, you remember, this is the story of the wedding feast. And you remember the servants were there and they had run all out of wine, and so uh, Jesus' mother comes to him and says, hey, we're all out of wine. He says, what do you want me to do about it? 
And she looks at the servants and tells the servants, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. These were specific servants that had a specific role for this particular feast, and they were under the authority of Jesus Christ in service, and they were told to do whatever their Lord had told them to do. It's a little bit more obscure reference in John 2, but in in Romans 13, we see the word deacon used in a very unusual way, and this is under submission to authorities. If you remember in Romans 13, it's saying that those who have authority are servants of God. That word servants is the word deacon. So the person that is given authority by God to govern is seen as a servant to God and to be in submission to God under his divine will and service. Wouldn't it be great if every person that was in politics that had been given some kind of authority would recognize that they are really a servant of God and should be subservient to the will of God in their service? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But that's what God says, is that these authorities are deacon. They are deaconing. They are serving you. But they have a specific and appointed task that they are performing. Lastly, in 1 Corinthians 3, in regards to divisions in the church... You remember those Corinthians, they always had troubles in their church in those early days. They just could not figure out how to worship well together. And one of the, thing, one of the problems they had was in regards to who they actually looked up to as leadership. You know, it's like the person that picks their favorite pastor and only reads that pastor's books and only listens to that pastor's message, and any other pastor that isn't their favorite pastor just isn't worth their salt. And they were having this problem in the early Corinthian church, and so you have the uh, comparison that Paul makes between himself and Apollos. And he says, who are we? Who is Apollos? Who is Paul? Are we not servants? Are we not servants? And so we see the term diakonos used in that way when Paul is comparing the servanthood, the servant nature, as it were, in the church. And so, one of the things that we see by this, of course, is that Apollos and Paul were appointed, and they were assigned this particular service in the early church. And it is that assigning and that specific type of nature that makes a deacon a deacon. So, that leads us to our third point, and the question, what kind of service should a deacon do? And what does a deacon perform in the duties of the church? Well, like I said, deacons are set apart for intentional service in the church, And the best way that I can think to guide us through this, as always, is with Scripture. And so we are going to turn to the book of Acts, and we're going to be in chapter 6. And we'll be reading for us uh, verses 1 through 6. This is what it says. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, that's the Greeks, arose against the Hebrews. Why? Because their widows were being neglected In the daily distribution. And the twelve, that's the twelve apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nick and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These seven they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. And so this is the earliest example that we have in the scriptures of the New Covenant Church, the New Testament Church, appointing deacons for service in the life of the church. And so there's a lot that we could glean from this. And just like any study, you know, if you were to really sit down and really think hard about this, you could probably come up with a hundred different points and many, many different things that you could actually say about deacons. I have five of them specifically that I want to try to point to Uh, as examples of how we see deaconing happening uh, in terms of them being set apart for intentional service in the church in the book of Acts. First, we see that the men who were, were chosen to serve were people, and this is very important, these were people that the church had known for some time. 
Let me ask the question. How else would someone know if they were of good repute, if they were full of the Spirit, or if they were wise? They knew this because these were people that were in the life of the church for quite a long while. They knew who the deacons were. It wasn't just some person off the street that they brought in and said, hey, do you want to serve the church? They knew who they were. And so that's the first thing that we see. You know, this really reminds me that God always provides for the needs of his church. In 1 Corinthians 12 is, is a portion of scripture that has been deeply convictional for me over our several years of service in the life of First Southern Baptist Church. It shows me that God has various giftedness in the body, yet it also tells us that God has given us these gifts. There's various gifts in the body, but it is God who has given us those gifts. I think too often, churches compare themselves with other churches. Or even worse, they compare themselves with some secular institution, and they say, here's how I think the church should be run. And we start playing comparing games. Well, this church has 25 deacons, right? We only have three or four. This church has seven pastors. Well, this church only has like two. It's not healthy to play those kind of comparison games because God is always sufficient for the needs of his church. And I firmly believe the scripture shows us that God has already been preparing and working on those people, sanctifying them, making them holy, preparing them for the service that they're going to have in the church. Doesn't that add deep meaning to your life? To know that God is calling you to service? I think we need to be careful when we play those kind of games because it says a couple things. A couple things that it says is that God is not provided for his church. Secondly, it would say perhaps that God is not sufficient for his church. And thirdly, and I don't intend this to sound too harsh, but it shows that we don't believe in the truth in God's word that he would really provide for us. And God provides deacons in the life of the church. I'm thankful for that. Second point is that deacons are set apart for specific service, okay? In this case, as we read in the book of Acts, it's the daily just distribution to widows. You've often heard this referred to as the waiting on of tables, right? They were the waiters and waitresses of the early New Testament church. I just think that's very interesting, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But just a, a point of warning about this. One of the reasons specific service is so important in the life of church is because a deacon without a real purpose and an intended direction of service can create the opportunity for a wandering deacon, right, for a lazy deacon. It's not that they maybe would want to be but it's they don't even know what to do. And so it's not healthy, I see, when we examine Scripture to have deacons that have no actual assigned duties. They just kind of wander around. I mean, how would you like to have a job where you're hired on and the first day of work they say, here's your job requirements, and it's a big blank sheet of paper. Do whatever you want. It'd be very hard to do a good job, wouldn't it? So think of it that way. Now, in regards to the bylaws, and of course, we're going through all of those right now, and we're reviewing all of those right now, and they are taking shape and taking form. Bylaws team has been working very hard to put that together. We need to consider how deacons might actually be structured in the future life of First Southern Baptist Church. And so, one of the things that we want to consider in regards to specific areas of service is will deacons have this more specific area of service in the future? And so let me try to just give some examples of this. And I'm, you need to hear me clearly. I'm not saying in any way that this is exactly what it will be, but it's just a thought. So can you all follow with me on that and say this is just a thought, okay? Here's some ideas. Perhaps we would have a deacon of stewardship or a deacon of properties or a deacon of hospitality, perhaps, or a deacon of missions. But I can tell you this, is that 
depending on these roles of how deaconing happens, it is going to depend on the needs of the church and the gifting of the saints. You hear me on that? It's going to depend on the needs of the church and the gifting of the saints, knowing that where there is a need in the church, God has provided somebody who can serve in that capacity. And so what we're going to do, church, is be uh, full of faith and full of hope and full of trust in our sovereign heavenly Father to provide for us as we need. Fair enough? Okay, point number three. Deacons were instituted, this is the third point that we get from Acts chapter 6, deacons were instituted to help with the load-bearing for pastors and to serve the saints in the church. Now we know why this is when we read scriptures, it's so the pastors could dedicate themselves specifically, and I don't know if this is in order or not, but it says in prayer and in teaching, it's teaching and preaching the word of God. So the pastors could have the burdens removed from them to do just prayer and teaching. Church, don't you want a prayerful pastor? When you think of the man of God who would lead you, don't you want one of the first things you think of to say that is a prayerful man? That is a man who lays the needs of the church and his own needs before God and is serving God first and foremost in the sacred place so that before he ever comes up to preach the word or bring you along to worship with him that his heart is already in the right place? You want a prayerful pastor, right? And you want a pastor who can teach and preach well. But how can the pastor do that if he is continually burdened with a hundred other things in the life of the church? This is where deacons come into play. Deacons come and help carry some of that load and carry some of that burden along with the pastor so that he doesn't have to worry about it. I can tell you I've had Many, many pastor friends over the years, and many of them have been a single pastor in usually a small rural church, and they do everything from council to weddings to funerals to mow the grass to preach to you name it, to clean the toilets, and they literally do everything. And I can't tell you how exhausting it has been for my friends who have had to serve in that kind of capacity. The preaching is worse for it. The overall service is worse for it. The overall health of that pastor is usually worse for it because they're constantly divided. But we see that God has graciously provided servants, deacons, to the church who can help carry part of that load. We're going to see uh, at the end of the message why it is so important that this is the case. Fourth, we see that deacons do not fulfill the role of pastor, but uh, that they do not preach or teach... um, Sorry, deacons do not fulfill the role of pastor. They do not preach or teach or have the authority of a pastor. But it does not mean that they cannot aspire to the role of pastor. I think there is evidence when we look in Acts chapter 6 and we see Stephen. You notice Stephen was already sort of being set apart in the role of deacons that Stephen could teach, he could preach, he could defend the faith, all of the type of qualifications you would see with Timothy chapter 1 in the role of elders, and so you could see that he could have aspired to be an elder, but it is important to remember that deacons and pastors have different callings on their lives, and they have different giftedness. And so it's that calling and that giftedness that really decides if a person is set out for deacon worship, deacon service, deacon worship, or pastor service. And so that's the fourth thing to consider. Thank you all for sticking with me through these points, by the way. I know that uh, this is not a typical message, and and I see your eyes are still up, and you're still listening, and you're still interested, so thank you for that. Let's close it out with point number five. Hopefully you'll like this one. The deacon selection process was not a GOB process. Do you all know what GOB is? That's my acronym. Good old boy. The deacon selection process is not a good old boy process. It's It's not because Billy Joe Bob wants to be a deacon and he's got 20 family members in the church, so just make him a deacon because he's a good guy. It's not that kind of selection process for the deacon. That is very, very important because serving in the life of the church is an extremely important task. We see the types of things that they looked for. They were looking for somebody that... Um, they, they wanted someone that was selected that was of good repute. That is, they had a good reputation. They were full of the Spirit, and they were full of wisdom. 
Isn't that the type of person you want serving you? That's the kind of person that helps the church thrive and live, that have their spiritual priorities straight in their life. And this leads us to the fourth point, which is this, that a deacon is a godly person. And they meet the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Of course, preceding this are the qualifications for elders, for pastors in your local church. And then the scripture in 1 Timothy 3 turns to deacons. And so this is what it says. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I've done a little bit of a word translation on this to try to draw out a little bit more of what Scripture is saying and, and maybe put it in words that would be a little bit easier to understand. And I'm going to do this with the first four verses. There are specific words that have been changed. So let's listen to this, church, and see if this helps to make a little bit of sense out of it. So this is the translation for verses 8 through 11. It says, deacons, like pastors, deacons, like pastors, must be worthy of respect, must be sincere, should not pay attention to or give consideration to much wine. They do not take kindly to dishonest gain, and they hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. They should first be examined, and if they are found to be above reproach, then let them serve. And so I'm going to do something here to wake us up a little bit. We're going to run a little drill through these qualifications because I don't have time uh, to preach through all of these qualifications. That would be a message all in itself. But what I do want to do is drill one specific thing into our minds this morning to help us understand what a deacon is. What is a deacon? Well, thankfully, I don't have the, the harder job of trying to define what a pastor or what an elder is in the life of the church because the word in Scripture... <laughs> that is used for pastor is the same thing, but has been translated many different ways, which has caused all kinds of confusion in the life of the church. When we know that an elder is a shepherd, could be referred to as a bishop, um, is also called pastor, most accurately in scripture is defined as an overseer. And there's lots of confusion around those words, but they all mean the exact same thing. Thankfully, I have the easy job because the word deacon can only mean one thing, and one thing only, and that is a servant. That is all it can be. Amen. Hallelujah. That took, that took literally two seconds to, pre to prepare that part of the message. Word study over. Thank you. Hallelujah. Well, let's have a little fun with a little drill that I've created to help sink this into our minds of what a deacon is. Remember, a deacon is a servant of God. And so I'm going to, to ask a question, and then you are going to answer, because they are, or I will say because they are, and you will say, a servant of God. Are you ready? Okay. Why should a servant, a deacon, be dignified and worthy of respect? Because they are servants of God. Why should their deacons be sincere? Because they are servants of God. Why should they not be persuaded to drunkenness? Because they are servants of God. It's interesting. I'm just going to stop for a second right there. A lot of people read that, and in most translations it says they are not addicted to much wine. Well, we read that in our context today, and we say, what does that mean? That they can be addicted to some wine? That they can, that they can get close to the edge, but they can't quite go to get over like... Elders can't touch it at all, but deacons can. Like, what is it trying to say here? The word study on that is the word that is saying 
does not pay much attention to, or would not give a thought to, or would not give a consideration to. What Scripture there is saying is that deacons would not even consider approaching a state of drunkenness. They would not even be tempted by it. Remember what I said? Deacons are godly men. They are holy men. They are not tempted by the ways of the world. Fourthly, why should a deacon not be greedy or trying to get rich in a service to the life of the church? Because they are a servant of God. You all are doing so well with that one answer. Boy, you got that down. Number five, why should a deacon have faith in the gospel with a pure conscience? Because they are servants of God. Sixth, why must a deacon be tested before they serve? Because they are servants of God. Why must your deacons live above reproach? Because they are servants of God. Why must a deacon, and this is, this is a really fascinating one, but why must a deacon, and I, I'm just going to say, a, have a steady and a faithful wife? Because they are servants of God. All right, let's generate all the oomph we have for this last one, okay? Why must deacons be faithful to his one wife and manage his own household well? Because they are servants of God. Church. If you hear nothing else, hear this one thing. Deacons are servants of God. It is not a lesser calling of a pastor. So many times, can I just be honest, I've heard deacons referred that way in the life of the church. Oh, I'm just a deacon. Or they're just a deacon. As if, as if there's some sort of a, a step they have to go up or get to. No. Deacons are extremely critical and important and have their own calling in the life of the church to serve in a godly and upright way. They are not just a deacon. They are a critical part of the giftedness of the body and for the proclamation of the gospel in this lost and corrupt world. One of the things that we see in verse 13 is that there is great assurance for the deacon who serves well. This is what verse 13 says. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. What I'm going to say here may sound a little bit cliche, but service is its own reward. People that have not perhaps matured to the point of developing a servant mentality in their life may have a difficult time understanding that statement. That service is its own reward. There's many, many benefits that come by being a sacrificial offering of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it manifests itself in a joy and a hope and a peace that you cannot experience anywhere else in your life. One of the questions I'd ask us is this, because it's a common struggle in our world today, is the idea of satisfaction, of feeling whole inside, of feeling complete. One of the questions that I would ask is that if you've been seeking for a type of greater purpose in your life and you can't seem to find satisfaction, could one of those reasons possibly be that you have not been serving God with your capacities? Or if you are serving, could it be that you have been serving, but you have, been not, you have not been serving in the purity of your heart and your conscience? Has it been just pure obligation for you? Have you been doing it because you feel like you have to do it? Or does it come, as Scripture says, through the heart of a deacon, with the purity of the gospel and sincerity of heart? says that they will receive great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. To serve the right way, we must remember that we can only serve God faithfully if we have a redeemed character. And so this leads me to the fifth point, and it is simply this, that a deacon is a redeemed believer. A deacon's a redeemed believer. And at this point, some of you might be saying, yeah, duh. 
We've been talking all this Jesus stuff for 30 minutes, <laughs> and I think I got the idea that a deacon should be a saved person, right? I'm not just making a passing point here, though. A deacon being a redeemed believer says a lot about the identity of the church and the way that we even perceive worship. We find in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, an interesting statement. And if you're reading Ephesians 4, I guarantee you'll just read right past this verse and you won't even see it. But it is a short, life-transforming uh, verse. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Ephesians and talking about redeemed character. And he's saying this about a person who is redeemed. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let me ask you this question. How can a thief no longer steal? How can a thief no longer steal? The only way a thief can no longer steal is if he has been redeemed, as if he has had a complete and total transformation of his entire person. Let the thief no longer steal church. What is it in your heart? I know in mine, as an early believer, one of the things that I was really tested with is before I was saved, um, I had a massive chip on my shoulder. And I just, for some reason, just hated the world. I would look at someone, and within five seconds, I would have an entire diagram of my mind of how could I insult and tear this person apart. And I was challenged in my early days of believing life. God would say, Michael, where you're going, where I'm going to send you, you cannot have this in your life. You must learn to love people. And God put me in so many situations where he would put me directly in front of somebody that I would have just torn apart. But God stirred and changed and made a new heart. Did he do that in your life? Has he changed your heart and turned your world upside down and given you a redeemed character? The deacon, the servant in the church, has this redeemed character. Church, the thief no longer steals. Instead, he labors with his hands. Why? So that he can give to those who are in need. That is the exact opposite of what a thief does, and that is redeemed character. The type of person who serves in the church, the deacon in the church, has this kind of redeemed attitude. They are not out for number one. They are not looking for dishonest gain. They are not trying to leverage some kind of influence or power. Those things are evil, and those things God detests. He hates that. Could you imagine anything more corrupt than someone who should be serving with a pure heart coming just to have influence, to try to politic their way into situations? Those things are evil. The real servant serves with a pure heart. Why? Because a deacon is a redeemed believer. He is a new creation. We must never lose sight of this, this main thing, that the gospel is what motivates service in the life of the church because we were once dead, but now we are alive. Ephesians chapter 2 is just a pure explanation of the gospel says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Church, that was written 2,000 years ago. Guess what? Still relevant today. That evil spirit is still at work in the sons of disobedience. We see that in our world, don't we? But it was this spirit among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. And then we have this great statement that changes everything. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, made us alive <laughs> together, with Christ, by grace, we have been saved, church. 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Church, that's a now and eternity statement. God is showing his kindness to First Southern Baptist Church right now. When you look around the room and you see redeemed people all around you, you are seeing God's graces and his kindnesses to you right now. Amen. But we are also going to see that for all eternity when God completely and totally pours out all of his holiness upon us and we will be made like Jesus Christ and we will worship in perfect purity and holiness of heart for all eternity. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I'm going to move on to point number six for the sake of time. There is much more that I would like to say in regards to redeemed life, but this won't be the last time I preach, so we will continue on with point number six. And This is, uh, point number six says that I just want to give a word of hope to the future ministry of First Southern Baptist Church. One of the reasons it's important to look at deacons and the role of deacons in the life and service of the church, and the reason that we think very clearly about how the Bible explains deacon service to us is because there are a great many blessings that come about as a result of being obedient and faithful to what the Word of God says about how we should order ourselves. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, this one verse says this, and it's a transitional verse um, in the book of Acts. Here's what it says. And the Word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This statement comes right on the heels of talking about deacons serving in the church. Now, let me ask you, why was the Word of God able to continue and to increase? Because the pastors didn't have to wait tables, quite frankly. Because the pastors were free to do the work that they were called to do. Why did the number of disciples multiply greatly? Because the body was functioning in such a way and the service in the church was functioning so well that they were free to do these things. Because the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. Because God is gracious and kind, but also because God honors faithful obedience to his word. As believers, sometimes that's one of the hardest things, especially for a church when it's looking at its identity. And there's so many different ways that we could do things, that we could... Uh, you know, make things function this way or that way. One of the hardest things for us to do, as believers even, as a church, is to just say, all we want to do is be completely faithful and obedient to the Word of God and trust God with the results. I'll tell you why I have a great hope for the future of First Southern Baptist Church, and I'm just going to step away here for a moment and uh, try to be a little bit more myself, a little bit more personable for this last statement because it is touching um, for me to talk about this. Um, My wife and I uh, will be celebrating eight and a half years, not of marriage, but we'll be celebrating eight and a half years since we came to First Southern Baptist Church. Boy, it seems like yesterday, doesn't it, Linda? It doesn't seem possible. Aiden was this tall. Sam, who's not here, you know, he's enjoying his honeymoon right now, but Sam was this tall. I could look down to Sam. Now, now I look up to Sam, right? It's amazing what can happen in that time. When we came to the church, all of the old leadership had completely left. There was a vote that didn't go the right way, and overnight, all of the leadership left. They were gone. Worship team, senior pastor, youth pastor, everybody, gone. And my wife and I had recently moved to the sunny side of the river in southern Indiana, and decided we were going to check out a beautiful, sunny, vibrant, healthy church. 
And so we went online and we found First Southern Baptist Church. And on the pictures, there was all these young families. And it was beautiful and wonderful. People were raising their hands in worship. And I said, we ought to go check that out because, you know, that's only a mile down the road. And we made the mistake many people make, which is uh, we thought the back door was the front door. <laughs> and so we came in downstairs. But thankfully, we had kids anyhow, so it worked out. And we came upstairs. And as we came up here, uh, there was a man here who was greeting, uh, Troy Clark. And, and Troy was the main greeter at that time in the church. And he happened to turn around and see us walking in. And if you know Troy, this will make perfect sense and be funny. But he turned around and said, just bear with us because all of the pastors left. But just stick it out with us and, you know, um, and, and, and just, just, okay. And that was about it. So we walk in here. And guys, I don't mean to be mean about this, okay? It was one of the worst worship services I've ever seen. A man got up here in his Air Force jumpsuit. I think it was Veterans Day. And he preached, or he, sorry, he sang directly from the hymnal with practically no music. And we sat there, and my wife and I thought, oh my gosh, what has happened here? The church was $800,000 in debt. We had an average Sunday attendance of around 35 to 40 people. It was over. It was done. The doors on this place should have closed long ago. And you know what God did when we talk about 1 Corinthians 12 and God gifting the body and putting somebody here, even though we only had 35 or 40 people. And Linda, I'm going to embarrass you. But Linda was pretty much born and raised in this church. But for many years, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, Linda basically sat and listened in the pews. But she decided that God had laid it on her heart to come up here and help lead the church in worship. And she did that for two and a half years, just about by herself, three years, and served. And many, many other people in the life of the church stepped up, and they served the body. And they served the body through a very difficult time period in the life of this church. My wife and I were wondering, is this where we want to raise our family? Is this where we want to do this? And we just kept feeling the Spirit of God. I don't know how to explain this to you, church, but we just kept feeling the Spirit of God saying, you must remain. This is the place for you. We have a purpose for you here. So why am I confident about the hope for First Southern? When I'm talking about a message on deacons, why am I confident about the hope of First Southern Baptist Church? Because church, I don't know if you can feel this, and I'm not saying that our faith is all about feelings. You know that I don't feel that way, but certainly God places on our hearts his Holy Spirit and church, I don't know if you can feel this, but I feel the Holy Spirit of God moving at First Southern Baptist Church. I see God preparing people. I see it with my own eyes. That don't think that you go unnoticed when you're here. We see that, and we recognize that. I see people being raised up for service in the life of the church. And the other thing that I've seen that's been really fascinating is that God has brought many young families into the life of this church over the last several years, and people that are extremely well-gifted to serve. So church, as we think about our lives of service and we think about what the future structure of this church looks like, let's be confident and let's be hopeful in that we have a faithful God who has given us what we need. He has prepared us for service. Your future deacons, they're already here. Isn't that comforting to know that? And God will raise us up. And God will continue to sanctify us and change us and make us more holy and help us serve in this church. It's a wonderful thing being a light on this hill, sharing the gospel, and seeing lives transformed. I want to see more of that, don't you? So let us consider that as we think about deacons, as we consider our own service in the life of the church. I'm going to pray real quick, and then we're going to transition quickly to communion. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for the gracefulness of my church family. Father, your word has said that if everything was said about you that could be said, that it would fill every book in the world. Even in today's digital age, it would fill every gigabyte and terabyte of information available on the planet, Lord. There could never be enough that could be said about your glorious character. 
and your sacrifice on the cross and the eternal consequences and benefits of salvation. Father, thank you that you have provided for your church, that you have given us this role of deacons to show us what uh, a new covenant worship looks like. Father, help us to do this well, Lord, and I do pray that you are working in the hearts of those individuals who will become deacons. Father, some of them are saying, uh, maybe I'm called to do that, but boy, I don't think I meet those qualifications. Father, please help sanctify us and help us to disciple and to prepare future leaders in this church and future servants in this church. Father, we're thankful for your abundant grace which is ever upon us and your abundant grace and mercies which have been on this church in the hill for almost 60 years. <laughs> Father, we love you. We know that you are gracious and kind and you love to hear the requests of your saints. Father, I, I do ask that you help us to worship well now as we go into this especially uh, endearing and important time in the life of our church, in the life of our church body, which is to come before you in the Lord's Supper. So, Father, help us to worship well in this uh, next period of time, in these next few minutes. Father, we know that you hear us because of your goodness. It's in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>